Hello and welcome to the commentary box. We have FA Cup weekend ahead of us. We've had a round of the Carling Cup, of course. There's been lots of news in the footballing world, including transfers. So this is today's podcast. Waiting for your stars to align. Well, I know it doesn't look like that. So yes, hello and welcome to the Commentary Box, a football podcast. I am Sam Turner and of course we are always, as always, joined by Jake Griffiths. How are you, Jake? I'm good, not too bad. Nice nice little early morning podcast all about football, can't go wrong. And it's a bit weird, but I, I did see the other day that, you know, Talk Sport, they actually do uh, like a football show where they get up at 6, 6 till 10 every weekday. Big commitment to football, that is. Oh, that, that's tough. I mean... If it's six from ten till ten, they probably have to wake up at like four o'clock in the morning. That's that's crazy. Because we're recording this on Friday morning at ten o'clock, and this is early for us. <laughs> yeah. Um. But yes, that is some commitment. Um. So in today's show, we're going to be talking a bit about Tottenham and their injury crisis. Um. And then we'll be moving on to Chelsea, of course, as of course Chelsea beat Tottenham in the Carling Cup semi-final last night in the second leg, beating them on penalties. Um. And also, then, we'll be talking a bit about Thierry Henry. We'll be off to France to talk about bit about his spell at Monaco, his short spell at Monaco, should I say. Um, and then, of course, we'll be talking about transfers as the transfer window is still open and there's been some interesting um, signings from across the world and in the Premier League. So, with no further ado, we shall move on to talk about Tottenham and their injury crisis. So, Jake... Um, You've heard that Deli Ali's that Deli Ali's out. We've heard that Kane's out, and we've heard that um, Son is now still in the um, Asian Cup. W- what's going wrong here with Tottenham, basically? I feel with the likes of the Asian Cup thing, you can't help that. That's just sort of a thing they would they knew would happen in their season. However, it is a thing that you can prepare for, and something that you can uh, you look out for, and you know it's going to be occurring. So it's something that Tottenham may have looked in to see if they could get someone or if they could play someone who would occasionally in that position to get used to it. Someone like Sissoko would probably fit into that role best um, with Ali normally playing on the other side of Son. So that would be like the ideal situation for him to sit in. But obviously we know Sissoko is nowhere near the level of Son. When it comes to the likes of Kane and Ali, this is just even more worrying because not only if you've not seen Tottenham invest at all in any signings, but they've got not only their best player out, but arguably their second best, or definitely one of them. And one of the guys who is assisting Kane a lot throughout the season. So to have both of those players out, plus a player away um, on the in the Asian Cup, things aren't going well. Remember, we, we talked about this a little bit at the beginning of the season, and we did our predictions. I actually predicted Tottenham would have quite a low finish um, in the league, because I felt, you know, when it comes to this sort of January, Christmas time, you know, they've got... Carabao Cup games, FA Cup game, Champions League, League Cup game, uh, just league games in the league as well. All of these games together, such a huge strain on all those players to be performing at a good level um, and to be competing a lot within a short space of time. And I said, you know, imagine if Harry Kane gets injured and this is exactly what happened. And who have they got? They've got Lorente. Yes, he's not bad but he's nowhere near Kane's level. You know, he, he's quite good aerially. He's a bit like Giroud in a way. Um, he's, he's got, and w- with that Kane quality of being so good at an aerial threat, more of a target man, but he's nowhere near got the finishing that Kane has. And now the likes of Ali's out. I know the likes of Harry Winks is starting to play a bit more in the squad, but again, very young, more inexperienced, doesn't really have those qualities that Ali does. Son being out, who have we got there? To, like, there's no one really there. We are saying before the show as well, Ericsson hasn't really been performing to the level that we would expect lately. Also, potential rumours that he could be leaving, um, possibly at the end of the season. So it's very hard to see where it's going to go from them. Um, obviously, they had a 
disappointing cup game uh, last night being knocked out to Chelsea on penalties. Um, but it's, it's hard to... It's, is, it, is it almost their fault, Sam, for not signing anyone that you, you look to them to go, well, you know, you've always got to take into account you might get injuries. Is it their fault that they didn't sign anyone? Well... I think it's a bit of 50-50 because, of course, you can't predict injuries in the end. All you can do is prepare for them. And I think the way it's happened has been really kind of unfortunate with both Deli Ali and Kane being injured at the same time um, as, um, of course, Son is out in the Asian Cup. But they could have prepared for this because, you know, they knew that um, Son would be going to the um, Asian Cup and they knew probably that South Korea would be getting as far as they are at the moment, which is, I think, the quarterfinals where they're playing, I think, Qatar. Um, so they know they knew about that. So they it, it's their job to find a replacement for that year, basically that season. So if anything like this happens, that they can just step in and do well. I mean, no offense to Lorente, but he is not a. I want to say he's a backup player for Tottenham. I would say he's a a different type of player, like someone they can bring on if they have no more ideas. If that makes any sense, it's a different yeah. kind of style. He doesn't fit into the the main style of Tottenham. Um, and then, of course, where do you go from there? You mentioned Sissoko, but he he doesn't really have a position at the moment where he fits in. He's just being played along kind of, I think, the left side, left-hand side, side of Tottenham at the moment. So it, it's one of these situations where they could have gone out in the transfer market this last summer and seen that Son will be out in most of January and thought, OK, we need a replacement for Son, definitely. And I don't think they did that. And it's kind of caught up with them here. Mm. And I, I was just thinking, trying to think of anyone else, Lucas Moore, if anyone who comes to mind that would sort of fit into that role uh, down on the side. But, you know, if someone, someone of a quality of Harry Kane's out, you've got to have a good backup. And I feel as if this was, it would almost be lucky if Harry Kane got through a whole season playing majority of the game, performing well and not getting injured or having a period where he might be resting for a game or two. I just feel Tottenham were a little bit naive. I don't know whether this was more like Pochettino's uh, idea or he didn't think we need to, they need to invest or whether the chairman thought that it was not worth it, a lot of money being spent on the new stadium. I'm not quite sure, but it's. I don't think we've ever really seen a team who'd never signed anyone to do very well in the league and to continue on. So I do think this could be the end for Tottenham in terms of this is the end of them challenging for any cup, the end of them challenging for the league title. Champions League is the only thing they could uh, potentially get get a good game or two in. But as far as I know, I feel like they've got a very good team in the next round. They may might have Barcelona. I'm not too sure on that. Um, but could, do you think now, because I, I, this, for me, this rules them out of the title race because I can't see Lorente and Winks and Lucas Moura performing anywhere near what Ali Sonnen came in playing. Well, yeah, I think um, Tottenham actually have um, Dortmund in the Champions League, which, oh, okay. which is still as hard as Barcelona at the moment because, of course, Dortmund sit um, top of the Bundesliga above um, Bayern Munich. Um, and yeah, I think it does rule them out of the title race. They are now nine points off of um, Liverpool in, of course, first place. So I think it's it's over it's over for them really, unless things go drastically wrong for Liverpool and City, which I can't see happening. I don't think they have a chance because, and this is no disrespect to um, the likes of Winks, Mora, uh, Lorente. They just they're not quality quality players that can be challenging for the Premier League maybe maybe in the future um the likes of Mora um and Winks are but not at the moment it's it's almost asking a bit too much of them mm, yeah I agree and I feel just <clears throat> if anyone's be injured Harry Kane their top man I think he comes back around March time and I just feel like it'll be too late uh that's that's it's almost about two months without him it just doesn't look good for them and their season. Like you're saying about Lorente, you know, they're not, they're not all, uh, all three of them, all three of them, are, you know, they're good players. Um, they just don't quite live up to that quality um, that Tottenham have already got and they're going to have to adapt in the way they play. And it, it, it widened the gap uh, between them and the likes of City and Liverpool now, who are still going to be head to head for it. And uh, very, this is a bit random sound, but with the, Premier League title, I did have a random thought the other day, and this is very bold, I'm not making a statement, just the idea. 
But could you imagine if Manchester United went on to win the league by winning every single game they played and just to keep on going? And what an amazing like achievement and stat that would be to throw that you've just got a 100% record, won every single game. Just want to get your thoughts on how unrealistic that would be. Well, they are 16 points off. So I think even if they win all their game from now to the end of the season, I can't see Liverpool losing another four or five games this season. I can't see Manchester City living, losing another four or five games. I just can't see that happening. Yeah, Manchester United could go unbeaten, but I still think they, I still mathematically think they won't actually be able to win the title from now. Yeah, I do think I agree with that. I'm still, I'm still stuck between whether I do believe <laughs> Liverpool are going to. I feel like. A game or two more, and I might, it might, I might be convinced because Liverpool are turning into that team now where they're sort of grinding out results as well. Yeah. You know, they're not just in those tough games where you've just got to get those wins. They're doing it, so they're definitely convincing me more. But back into sort of finish up um, with Tottenham, obviously with their game uh, last night in the Carabao Cup second leg uh, of the semi final, it looked like. They will be going through because I think they were, were they two one up on the first leg or one nil up. Uh, I think it would have been two one to um Tottenham. Two one to Tottenham. Oh no, I think that, sorry, I think there might have been one nil because oh, yeah, one nil. Yeah, uh, sorry. Because yeah. it was two all overall. Um, so Tottenham obviously being one nil up. I think that that penalty Kane uh got and scored, and then to go into this game away from home against Chelsea side who did not do very well in their last game. It looked like it would be Tottenham's chance to go through, and I did. did I did think that Tottenham would would edge it. I, I didn't think it'd be. A, I thought it would be a tough game. I didn't think it'd be close. Uh, sorry, I didn't think it'd be like far away. I didn't think Tottenham would smash it. I thought it'd be a close game, but I did think they would edge it, and I was proven wrong because obviously Chelsea came away um, scoring two goals: one from Kante, one from Hazard. Lorente did peg one back the 2-1, um, but Tottenham were not playing very well, uh, especially first half, and then going into penalties straight away, because I don't think they do extra time anymore. Um, so it went straight to penalties, because they don't do the extra time in the Carabao Cup, and it was not very good for Tottenham um, at all at the beginning. I think Eric Ericsson scored first, which he did do well, uh, and then likewise with, I think it was William, um, and then we had the likes of Eric Dyer after his great penalty in the World Cup to uh, make England win that shootout against Colombia. Absolutely skied his penalty. Rosed, very, very poor. And then I believe it was Lucas Moore of penalty was saved by Kepa. And then David Luiz with his traditional long one up, slotted it past Paolo Gazania, ex Gillingham, of course. Um, and to made them go through into the final, which they'll be playing Manchester City. And just a quick side point, Sam, before we sort of move on to Chelsea. Do you think that is going to really damage Tottenham? Because obviously a lot of people talk about Tottenham and say, you know what, they need to be winning trophies this season. Uh, I think we've come to expect of Tottenham now that they they don't necessarily win a lot of trophies. And I think another year of not winning trophies is not the end of the world for Pochettino, for the players at Tottenham and for Tottenham. I think it's been a bit of an interesting season, of course, um, with not being able to move into the new stadium yet um, and having to play at Wembley still. Um, so I think next year is a more important one for them. And if they don't win any trophies next year, I think that would be a more bad thing. But this year, I think it's just one of those in-between seasons. It's obviously not gone the way that anyone's planned with the injuries and with the way they've gone out last night with the with the Champions League draw against um, Borussia Dortmund and the way the league's gone. It's just, it's not fallen into place this year, but I think it's not the end of the world yet. Mm, I just feel like there's always something with Tottenham that makes them not do as well as, for example, <clears throat> at the moment they've got Kane injured and you know, next season could be like, oh, you know, we've got the new stadium to adjust to, and it doesn't look it just doesn't look great for them, to be honest. I think because are they still in the FA Cup? I, th- I believe they are. I think yeah, I think they are, and I th- can't remember who they're playing, but I think it's a Premier League team. Ah, uh, I'll have a look. So that could be very important. Um, I have a feeling it's Crystal Palace. Let me just have a look quickly. Sure. So I feel like with Tottenham now, it's just. Because sometimes I used to think, you know, it's fine for Tottenham to not win trophies. They're not at that stage. But 
I feel like potentially they are, or are they again missing a couple of new signings? Like, imagine their whole team's fit. Is that side a side that should be winning trophies? I'm not sure. I don't think they've exactly got quality wing backs. They haven't really got a quality midfield. Like you've got the likes of Dyer, who yes, good player. The likes of Winks. Ali is more sort of attacking midfield, like was Ericsson. But that sort of central midfield, they've lost Dembele now. Who have they got that's really quality? I'm unsure of. Yeah, I know what you mean. I think the midfield and... Uh, it's hard to explain. I think all their players are top-class players and would find themselves in most top four sides. But yeah. I think a lot of them might find themselves as backups in a lot of the teams and that's not not saying they're not top class because all of them are basically top class but they're like they're not uh, Harry Kane's the only world class player there if it makes any mm. sense uh, with Ericsson when he's on form so I think I, I know what you mean but I still think they should at least be winning a, like one trophy since they kind of went on this kind of great kind of era we're going to call it now <laughs> apparently uh, with Pochettino yeah I agree but yes that um with the Carling Cup, that kind of moves us nicely on to Chelsea and the current situation with Sari and the, of course, they're getting they're, they're now going to be in the Carling Cup final. Um, and I just want to know how do you rate um, Sari's season in charge of Chelsea compared to Conte's last season? Well, at first, I thought you know what this is a lot better than Conte, and I, I thought this was an amazing start. I believe at the, end, at the beginning of the season performing very, very well, and everything looked great. But now it seems as if they've done a little bit worse. I'm not so sure. They've just had a... They've gone through a, quite a bad spell lately. Um, there was some disappointing things that happened with Sarah in terms of match day interviews. Uh, we know we had that report the other day where he said it was hard to motivate Chelsea players. And Could that be like a psychological tactic to sort of help them get motivated, so to speak, and to want uh, sort of the, he wants the players to sort of give a reaction. And so, you know what, we're not, this is how we play, et cetera, et cetera. But so I just, I feel as if Sari has done very well some points and then hasn't at all. Um, some Chelsea fans, and I think this is a good question to ask, are they really doing much better than they were under Conte? Because under Conte, I think they, did they win the FA Cup? They definitely won the FA or League Cup. Um, they won one of those. And then to go into another season and to, to start so well was so convincing they're going to do well. But lately, it seems like there's so many things happening. There's a big thing about Jorginho the other day about is he even good enough to be anywhere near that Chelsea side? Because there were a lot of pundits slating his performance against Arsenal the other day. Just really questioning what he adds saying that the likes of Kante and Hazard are playing up position under Sarri as well isn't exactly great. A couple of new signings here and there. David Luiz playing nowhere near the qualities that he was playing a couple of seasons ago. Things don't seem to be going great at the moment. The only real good thing is, you know, they've won this uh, League Cup game and now they're in a final of a competition. Yeah, uh, true. Um, And with the um, kind of the Jorginho comments and kind of that I think with the Arsenal game, I think they, I think teams have just tr found a way to stop Chelsea because I, I watched the game, um, the Chelsea Arsenal game, uh, was it last week? And yeah. what Arsenal were doing, they just put um Ramsey on Jorginho. Jorginho did not have any space on the ball, didn't have any time. He couldn't get any um, kind of space at all, and it just kept him out of the game, which I can see why players or um, pundits might think that means that Jorginho has had a bad game. But it's just the way that the um, Arsenal have played mean that he can't show his best abilities. Um, but other than that, I think Chelsea were actually just terrible against Arsenal. Um, the worst I've ever seen them play, I think. Um, with uh, Kante, he's out of position, as you mentioned. He's playing too far up the pitch for, for like my liking. Um, has added it through the middle. That is a terrible idea because he doesn't he, he he's even admitted himself he likes to play off another player like a player like Giroud um mm. so obviously Sarri is trying new stuff and he's and he got some good results at the start of the season but whatever he's doing now isn't working um and it's 
it might just take a bit more time for the players to get used to his style and his tactics. Um, but you you uh, mentioned me to me before we came on about um, his press conference and about how he couldn't get the um, players um, motivated. Do you want to just kind of like expand on that a bit? Yeah, so I, I think it was after the Arsenal game, and yeah, I think <clears throat> Sorry was asked on sort of what was the reason for their uh, their defeat today, and what were the main things that he would be looking to improve, and what what did he struggle with in terms of sort of preparing for the match? I think one of them, and the big one he said, was that he simply f- said it was so challenging to motivate the Chelsea players and. We hear these things come out sometimes, you know, when, when Mourinho said that sort of things that sort of confuse you a bit, you're not sure why he said it. And sometimes those things do work. <clears throat> they could be things that are sort of working in sort of reverse psychology, so to speak. So where, you know, the players will hear that and they're not going to hear it as a negative thing. They're going to hear it as, oh, I'm going to do that now. I'm going to prove him wrong. I'm going to show him I can be motivated. And sometimes for certain players that works and he knows that group of players better than I do. That could be exactly what Chelsea players need right now. So it could be a very, very tactical, uh, great piece of um, sort of managerial tactic there. Um, on the other hand, it can be a very negative thing, and it almost seems like he's clutching at straws. He's shifting the blame. It's one of those things you hear managers say. You know, at the end of their time, they start turning their back on the players and they start blaming them. And it just seemed a very, very bad thing to say about where they were because it seemed like that was the opposite of what they needed. So it's going to be really interesting to see if that works. Obviously, they won that cup game, so potentially it could have. But I did think still the likes of Hazard and Kante were still playing out position. However, both of them did score, so potentially he could be trying maybe more so to adapt players and see potential in the way they play. I'm not sure about the the, the um, Hazard thing. I think Hazard is definitely more suited playing off another player, like you said. The Kante thing, again, it just doesn't seem right. Like He just hasn't got those qualities of the, that a central like, attacking midfielder would have. You know, the likes of Ross Barkley, someone who suits him to there. But again, Chelsea don't really have too many options in that attacking midfielder role. The likes of Fabregas is now gone. Who have they got that's going to be playing now? Obviously, Jorginho is a defensive midfielder. So it's going to be interesting to see how Chelsea go throughout the rest of the season. And potentially, I know it's unlikely, but they could bring in another name. I'm not sure, but someone to fit into that attacking role who is of a good quality. Obviously, they brought in Higuain now, but someone they brought in there, they could that could turn things around and could, could make them looking like they could start to challenge for the league potentially. Yeah, I, I would agree with you there. Um, they are, I think, maybe just a bit far off um, challenging for the league. But I think, as you said, with um, Higuain coming in um, from Napoli and, and Higuain's record with Sarri, I think it, it can only be a good thing for Chelsea. I think that it's a type of striker they need, in, at least in the short term. So I think it can be, only be a good thing. Um, I can see their fortunes changing if they win a cup this year. I think Sarri's obviously done a good job, so... What we will see, really, shouldn't yeah. <laughs> so, um, do we want to talk about transfers now, or do we want to go on to France and have a look at Ooh. Thierry Henry's spell at Monaco? It's up to you now. <laughs> All the decision. Um, I think we should start with Thierry Henry. I feel like yep. we should start with sort of the the bigger news before we move on to the transfers, uh, rumours, and obviously those which have happened. And before we go into it, Sam, obviously we know that Henri had only spent three months uh, at Monaco, did not do very well, nowhere near as well as he wanted. Can't really remember. I don't think they even won too many games at all under him. Um, and I just want to get your first your thought on managers, uh, sorry, players or ex-players going to be there, going to manage their first club. And what sort of club do you think that should be? Because we've seen the likes of you know, Lampard and Gerrard going to manage their first clubs at Derby and Rangers, both doing very, very well. But then we've seen the likes of sort of um, Gary Neville and uh, Henri going to the likes of Valencia and Monaco, and it's worked out appallingly. So is that just a case of it's just sort of luck or the way things go, whether you're going to do well or not? Or do you feel like managers have sort of taken more... Sol Campbell approach where you know he's gone to a lower league club to start down low and build his way up to the Premier League well um it's a tough one really and I think it depends on 
a lot of things. So, of course, Thierry Henry, it was his first step into management. Um, he, I mean, he was assistant manager with um, Belgium um, under Martinez. But, yeah, it's not gone well from Monaco at all. Um, only winning, like, two games in 20, I think the stats were. I mean, Monaco were already in the relegation zone and they still are in the relegation zone after he's been um, sacked. But, yeah, I think... It could go either way with ex-players. Obviously, you've got some really good ex-player managers um, who do end up doing really, really well. Like Eddie Howe, I know he, he was an ex-player, of course, with Bournemouth. And the, the, the names kind of go on from there. Um, but then again, some players just flop, like Gary Neville, of course, who um, was terrible at um, Valencia didn't do it great at all and now we've got Thierry Henry who's not done great at all and I think sometimes it's about the mentality I mean obviously mm. there should be an automatic amount of respect between the players and the past player because lots of the time that players idolise their the manager that they're going to be working for but also sometimes it can be a bit of arrogance maybe between the um, past player and the um, players they're managing because they might see themselves as like oh yeah I've I'm I'm here because I'm a big name, if that makes any sense, rather than I'm a really mm. good manager. If that, so I, I can imagine there might be a bit of resentment, resentment between the players and the manager in that sense, and that there might not actually be that respect. Um, but I think mainly it's about attitude of these past players. I think Sol Campbell, he's obviously um, had the situation where he's not been able to get a top job. So he's actually gone back a bit and gone down to... Um, I think it's Mayors, oh, not Mayersfield, um Macclesfield. Uh, Macclesfield, and he's and he's working well there. He's I think shoring up the defence um, and keeping them out of the um, relegation zone almost in League Two. Um, but yeah, I think it's about attitude. And if if a past player goes into a job, kind of, and doesn't, what do you say, um, expect that respect at first, I think that's the right situation because it's like you got to earn that respect as a manager. You can't just go from mm. being a player to being a manager and it's, assume that your respect continues over. It's a completely different um, kind of ball game. So I think, obviously, Thierry Henry has got it wrong. Um, Gary Neville's got it wrong. But there's a lot, plenty of examples of other past players getting it right. True. I think I agree with that. I think that's a good thing to talk about. So then, <clears throat> sort of go directly to um, Henri now. I feel, you know... You say Monaco in the relegation zone, those sort of things don't really sound like they come together at all. And I think it just highlights what an appalling job that our roof happened. Yes, it's his first proper job as obviously being the main man, the manager. Um, but you, you, I don't know. I feel like when I saw the appointment come, I thought, you know, what, this might be quite good. He goes back to France. He gets a bit, a bit more experience. You know, obviously being the assistant manager of Belgium, I forgot to mention that. Um, you know, that's definitely going to help him build some sort of confidence and experience in terms of <clears throat> what sort of thing to do being a player for so long at such a top level. He's got a great idea of how teams work, etc. So when when you hear those sort of things, it sounds great and it sounds like, yes, you know what, this can be uh, their big chance. He could do very well. Obviously, coming down to it in the end, didn't go nowhere near how he wanted it's hard to say. Do so you think potentially, Sam, we know we don't know too much detail, but I guess this is more in general about managers and more time. Do you feel like a manager who has had not really much experience at all should be given more time than one who doesn't? Mm, it depends on the situation, because obviously with Monaco, he, he was brought in charge to take them out of the relegation zone because... um. Is it uh, Yardin, the uh, manager who, of course, guided them to um, a league title in 2017, didn't have the greatest of starts this season. Um, and I think with Thierry Henry and Monaco in this situation, he shouldn't be given in more time because he's had he's had 20 games. That should be enough. Um, I think it's just not good enough. Of course, yeah. pl um, these ex-players have to learn their trade and have to go through the bad times. But with Monaco, it's such a big club, you expect to be doing well. And if you take that job, you expect the pressure, you expect to be basically sacked if you don't do well. So if you if you if you'd say gone down to a lower league team, I think you can afford a bit more time because you're getting used to it more, you you've committed to the club, you're but with this, you're going to a big club and you're expected to do well straight away. Mm. And I think just to sort of touch on the last thing uh, <clears throat> before we move on to transfers. 
can you think of any club um, with a manager who's sort of been, you know, suffering in the relegation zone and then suddenly they just turn it around and they start to just sort of boost out? Because I can't think of any club really that's been struggling, hasn't had a managerial change, but then it's got out of the relegation zone after hard work and determination. I can't really, it's always been a change or a new signing or something's happened. Um, it's, I feel like sometimes, although it is disappointing to always sack managers and get new ones in, if that's anything that works, can't blame them. Yeah, I think the only example I can think of, which is kind of part of the miracle, as you'll later now know, oh. um, basically is Leicester with um, 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 Nigel Pearson, um, who basically, I think it was their first season in the Premier League, they were sitting like, um, not rock bottom, but like in a relegation zone, quite far away away from kind of being safe. And then, then at the end of the season, they just went on this run to basically stay up. And I think that's the only example I have. But yeah, most cases of kind of great escapes are where a player has come in or a manager has been changed. So I, it's it, for Monaco, I think it was definitely, they couldn't have given them any more time. So we've had our time in France now, so it's time to um, bring us back to the UK as such, um, and it's time to talk about um, transfers. So, of course, the big transfer so far has been Higuain to um, Chelsea, but there has been a few other interesting transfers so far in the transfer window. One that we haven't mentioned is Ryan Babel, of course, a player in my Christmas 11, um, for our Christmas special. He has now made the move from um, Turkish football to Fulham um, under Ranieri, and that's, a, that's an interesting signing because, of course, he's played in the Premier League before with Liverpool, but it's been a long time since he's been on the main radar of um, mm. English football so I just want to know how do you think he'll do at Fulham Jake I think there's a really interesting signing uh, I definitely did not see any him <coughs> him signing for an English club um, I feel like it's almost a little too late not for Fulham so to speak but for him I, d I feel like he's quite old now isn't he he is um uh... It's got to be thirties, maybe. He's got to be like thirty-one, or I, I would say. And I feel like he's he's almost at that age when he's a bit too old. He's not in his prime anymore. He's made that sort of like relaxed move to um, Turkey, which often we see top players do. And I just I can't really see them doing that great under him now. I, I just feel it's almost it's it's come and gone. It's happened, and I I can't really see them doing very well at all with him and I feel like that's not his fault he's just almost too old gone past his prime um and it's not quite what what Fulham need right now I feel like Fulham obviously yes they need some signing they need to bring in someone but maybe not the uh the, the best move in the world for them yeah I think it's one of those panic buy situations um in a way for Fulham there um other signings we've seen um in the UK is we've seen um of course um what's his name uh, Ashley Cole moving to Derby which is Ooh. another interesting one um I wanted to know how, how you feel about this signing of course he's linking up with his old um teammate in um Frank Lampard I think he's only going to be there for the next six months and then I think he's retiring from football altogether so mm. do you think this could work out for Derby or do you think it's just a bit of expensive um wage for a player that might not feature that much i actually think that it might be a really good signing i feel like we quite often see you know ex premier league players and not, I don't, don't say the word legend but definitely very good ex premier league players um but we've never really i don't think we've seen many go down to the championship after being away and doing well and i feel like he is obviously a bit better uh a better signing <clears throat> than the fulham signing so Potential. I, I, no, I don't. I don't want to sort of contradict because obviously I've just said that I, I feel that um, the the Fulham player, sorry, uh, who who got so you know he's he's out of his prime. He's made a relaxed move. Yes, Ashley Cole's done the same, but I feel like because he's going to a lower level and he's linking it with an old teammate, and I feel like he's in a position where his experience could definitely pay off for him. And I do. I still think he's a fairly uh, fast player. I feel like that could be quite a good move. I don't, I, I don't, I couldn't name uh, the Derby left back right now, um, but I actually think that could be potentially quite a good move um, and could, could work out well. I'm just trying to think in other news. Um, again, the young young Chelsea player who Bayern Munich have been interested in is it Callum Hudson Endoy? Yes, Endoy. It is, yeah. Okay, um, 
first time I pronounced that correctly, so I'm very happy with that, by the way. Um, <laughs> but I believe he has rejected a Chelsea contract extension, as far as I know. And it was for a very, very big sum. So I feel like, even though he's still at Chelsea right now, he's rejected the con- So he's basically saying he doesn't want to commit to Chelsea long term. But it's almost like we're waiting again for Bayern to make another offer. I think it might be their fifth offer if they make another one because they've made offers after offers and Chelsea have kept on saying, no, higher, higher, higher. So whether they're going to agree, and I just feel now like if Bayern don't agree, are they even really going to play Endoy that much now? Because he said, you know, I don't want to be with the club. It's just not great for Sari and the chairman. It doesn't... It doesn't really inspire confidence showing that that player wants to play for the shirt unless it's more of a, you know, I'm happy playing for the rest of the season, but I don't want to play any longer. I don't know the ins and outs of it, but I don't think it's the greatest thing to happen if he doesn't get sold to buy him in this window. Um, anyway, I just, I feel like we had a little chat about this last time, Sam, where we said, you know, do we think it should be worth going? I think, I can't quite remember what you said. I think what I said was that I felt it was a good move for him. And, you know, we've seen a lot of young English players doing very well in the Bundesliga this year. And it would be a good move. Um, what was it? That, what was your thoughts on it again? Um, I think the similar kind of situation. I can't remember what I said before, but I think he was basically saying that if he stays at Chelsea, I think it's not the end of the world because I think he can try and prove himself there and kind of make a name for himself at Chelsea, become a legend if he just continues there. Because mm. Sarri, though he likes to bring um, youth through, I think he does stick with a like a starting 11 and plus one sub. He's always been famous for like heaving to his like 11 players or 12 to 11 players. So I think it might be hard for Callum Hudson-Odoi to kind of break through that. But I think if he does, he can really make a name for himself at Chelsea, but I do not blame him at all if he wants to go to Bayern Munich because yeah. it, there's opportunities for English footballers um, abroad in Germany. And if you see how like the likes of um, Reese Nelson are doing, um, Jaden Sanko, um, it's just it's it's almost promoting him to go. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if he does. And I wouldn't be like saying that's a bad decision if he does. Agreed. Um, I'm just trying to think of any more sort of transfer. Obviously, we have the. Uh, Fabregas move, but I think that happened before our last uh, podcast, so we would have mentioned that already. Obviously, Defoe scoring a debut. I think that's the the sixth out of seventh club debuts he's had. He's scored, or fifth out of six, something like that. A very, very good records making an impact. Um, I think Rangers did actually end up losing their first game with him, um, but they definitely scored, and already the Rangers fans have a chant for him, which is um, very interesting. Um, <laughs> but in terms of in terms of Gillingham, nothing's going to happen at all. Um, we've signed, we, we, we've made a couple of contract extensions with our youngsters, a couple of loan deals, um, but not really anything in terms of big names or first team football. Um, anything on the Swansea front? Absolutely nothing. I mean, there's a few rumours about Bonnie leaving to Turkey, which I wouldn't be so disappointed because he's obviously on a high amount of Wait, wages. Sorry, has he been there before? Turkey? Uh, no, I think he came from Holland um, ah. and he's played in the Czech Republic before but no nah, I don't think he's he's never been to um, Turkey yet but we have got um, Andrei Ayu at um, a club in Turkey at the moment in Fenerbahce on loan so it'd be another player going out to Turkey but yeah I wouldn't be too disappointed if he does leave because he's on massive wages and it might mean we are able to sign someone this transfer window but of course we don't have a lot of money to make any signings at all so it's unlikely we will um on the other transfer news, um, I've, I saw just a really interesting one um, a few days ago on uh, mm. Twitter, I think it was. And that was um, Kevin Prince Boateng, at the oh, age yes. of 33, is it now, I think, um, going on loan for six months to Barcelona from um, Sassuolo in, um, in, in Italy. And it's a crazy transfer. I just want to... I want to know, what do you think your craziest transfer that you remember um, is, basically? <sighs> Craziest. <clears throat> I think in terms of money, yeah, the two ones that come to mind are the the ridiculous almost two hundred million Neymar one, and the extortion amount of money that Liverpool played for Andy Carroll, who didn't do nowhere near as well as I thought. Yeah, um, I'm trying to think of the the 
biggest and the most ridiculous uh, price and sort of signing that did not very well at all. God. <laughs> I, I feel like the Andy Carroll one just sticks out there. The name I won, obviously, because the price was outrageous. Um, what about you? Um, well, mine is actually a, um, a Swansea player that we signed a few seasons back, um, and that player is David Ungog. Um, we were struggling for relegation at the time when we were in the Europa League, and I think uh, Laudrup had um, just been sacked or was going to be sacked the next week, and we signed David Ungog for around three million from Bolton in the Championship after he had had probably not the best of seasons. David Ungog, anyways. Um, he ended up playing about four games for us and then left and basically hasn't been seen since. He's been playing, I think, a bit in Turkey, a bit in the um, kind of championship still. And it was just a crazy transfer because he wouldn't have brought anything to the side, really. And it was just, <laughs> I remember him coming. I was like, what, what, what is this? What, why have we signed David and Gog? So that was yeah. probably my weirdest one. But yeah, Carol, of course, that's a really weird one. And the Neymar was just like a distortionate price. But of course, mm. Kevin Prince, Boeing 10 to Barcelona I think he's going to be living his dream as he said he's had a <laughs> bit of a weird career he's been like to, from Portsmouth now to Swallow to AC Milan it's been a bit Mental. of a crazy career but now to find himself at Barcelona at the age of 33 is very crazy indeed <laughs> <laughs> I think how did that even come about like surely he would have just been sitting there randomly and then his agent gets a call and his, and his agent's just like I've just got you a job at Barcelona <laughs> basically and, he just, and he's going to be like what no way <laughs> I'm 33 are you sure they've not got the wrong player <laughs> yeah but yeah because he started well at Swasolo um, this year um, really mm. well he's been playing as like a forward for like a bit oddly because I've always remembered him as a kind of a midfielder but apparently he's playing up front at the moment kind of feeding other players into the game so it could be really interesting to see how he does it um Barcelona but I'm I'm very pleased for him <laughs> he, he's done well yeah he's Hats done off. very well and his agent as he said has done very well indeed <laughs> but yeah it, I think that wraps up the um transfer front unless you can think of any other interesting transfers that have go on, gone on or that look like they might be going ahead in the future I feel like the only one that I can really think of, and it's League One orientated, is ex uh, Gillingham and West Ham and Norwich player Matt Jarvis has been signed for Walsall. Ah, oh, yes. Uh, which is a very good signing for them. And he actually got, I think, two of the assists uh, for the hat trick that Cook got against Gillingham last weekend, sadly, his first <laughs> game back. But he did get a standing ovation from the Gilles fans because he certainly enjoyed his time. And that was. I believe he played very, very well for us, and that got his big move to Norwich and from them to West Ham. So, happy days for him. Not so for Chillingham, uh, but yeah, that's the only one that sort of stands out for me. Yeah, that's a, that's a, I think that's a good story, that, because, of course, he's been injured at quite a while um, at a Norwich. I think he's he is an England-capped player as well, so for Warsaw to get him is great, and for, I guess, him to get two assists on his debut against um, against uh, um, Gillingham is probably not the best for you, but it's a nice yeah. kind of way for his story to continue, I guess. <laughs> just, just to add on it as well, I actually remember <clears throat> reading about when he got his call-up and he was actually um, out with his family having a curry. Yeah. Uh, when he got his call up, and then he was sitting there just eating, his, getting a golf call from his agent. Um, or I think I think it might have been direct from the England manager at the time, actually. Um, <laughs> and he's just sitting there, and he's like, he cannot believe it. And then his parents are sitting around him, or he called them straight away, something like that. Um, and he was just out, random, you know, just in, not even not even really expecting. It. I think he'd been playing good football. Um, but wasn't expecting a call-up at that time. So, um, very exciting times. Exactly, exactly. And that's a nice way, I think, to wrap up the whole podcast together with Kevin Prince, Boateng and Matt Jarvis. I didn't think we'd be ending the show on those two topics, <laughs> but the way it's happened, it's been very interesting. Of course, we hope you've enjoyed um, this podcast. Um, enjoy your footballing weekend. If you haven't checked out already, you can check out our preview to the um FA Cup fixture between Swansea City and Gillingham um, of course because we're both um, fans of the teams respectively so go check that out and of course go check out other things on our channel but yes um, enjoy the show today it's goodbye from me goodbye uh, see ya thank you for listening to today's podcast if you'd like to get involved with us online you can do so on social media we're on Twitter Instagram and Snapchat. We do lots of polls and posts on there. That is all under Bob's commentary. And then secondly, if you'd like to listen to our podcasts on different websites and devices, you can do so 
on iTunes, Spreaker and YouTube. All of those are under the commentary box. And then lastly, personally get involved with us by email to ask any questions or queries. You can do under the email of the commentary box, dot contact at gmail.com. 